We'll be talking about the secrets of the Sumerian Shah tonight, and it's going to be a great talk. You're going to get some real knowledge. You know, we're talking about the Sumerian civilization, which is supposed to be only six to 7,000 years old. However, it's been proven that these tablets that have been discovered, not all of them, but a lot of them, a lot of the, the ones that seem to have these grand stories were copies of copies of copies of copies. And how do we know this? Because copies of copies of copies have already been found in some cases. And even with some of the information slightly being changed, like for example, in the Numa Elish, Marduk, during his kingship, decided to change the name Nibiru to his name because he wanted to be the destroyer. See, so this kind of stuff comes out when real archaeologists and researchers start digging into it. And then all of a sudden, these extra tablets pop up, and now they actually appear in different museums around the world, like the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, and the British Museum, and uh, of course, in England as well. You can go there. I've been to both. So we're talking about the Sumerian civilization, one of the earliest in the world, and it's left a profound legacy that continues to fascinate us. I mean, people are talking about this all the time. People being researchers, investigators, archaeologists, they can't, they can't seem to get away from the Sumerian text because it encompasses everything and so many languages sprung out of it. The cuneiform writing system and the creation of various texts, including the Sumerian Kings list, like I said, it stands out. It makes you scratch your head and challenge, well, how old is Homo sapien? How old really is Homo sapien? Because if these texts are giving out years and time frames that go and span for tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years, then the archaeologists that have to go along with the mainstream are going, we better bend this into our little system here. We better bend this into our own agenda-based knowledge, because if we don't, then all of a sudden, people are too old. And if they're too old, then evolution doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and we don't want to tip the apple cart. We don't want people thinking that they're, that human beings and beings have been on this planet far longer than we have been told. Far longer. I mean, incredibly longer. They don't want that information to come out. They just don't want it to come out. The Sumerian Kings List is an extraordinary historical doc document that actually outlines the reigns of Sumerian kings from a pre-dynastic ruling era. And these were historical figures who governed up until the downfall of the Sumerian civilization. Now, the Sumerian civilization didn't really particularly have a specific type of a downfall. They had a geological disaster that created a collapse of society. But later on, you discover that they restart the civilization in Kemet, in ancient Kemet, long before it was called Egypt. Now, Kemet already had an advanced civilization there prior to the Great Flood, but it seems as if they moved there and made the new home base, the land of Kemet, and everything sprung from Kemet there forth after the Great Flood, post-diluvial. But anti-diluvial, it seems as if headquarters of advanced knowledge and wisdom, it seems as if it's coming out of this area called Sumeria in Mesopotamia, right? The land between two rivers. Although there were civilizations existing around the entire planet, we have records from these people that date back pre uh, anti-diluvial, before the flood, pre-flood pre text, okay? The list not only chronicles the names of the kings and lengths of their reigns, but also provides insights into the Sumerians. I mean, deep insight. And a lot of people won't spend the time to dig into this. They just want to listen to other people and their perspective and not do their own research. So they had views on kingship. And it was based on the divine right to rule and also was based on the nature of time. Time frames played a huge role in the time that they became kings and rulers, and sometimes queens or goddesses, because they did have a few women that also ruled over the entire planet 
at one time antediluvial, and their names are on the Sumerian kings list. So shout out to the women. We need more women rulers because look what men have done to this planet. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We destroyed this planet. Men with their egos and their desire for power. And now we have the, the Internet and the YouTube clout chasers that use other people's names to build their accounts and attack people. Men, 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 we're horrible. It's horrible. Men have done a disjustice to the human race and to the planet as a whole. We are running this planet like it's a gigantic bachelor pad. The balance of feminine and masculine energy is off. There needs to be balance there. And the balance is too far to one side. Yes, you need the divine masculine, but you also need the divine feminine. And what have men done since the beginning of recorded time? They've oppressed and suppressed women's voice. They've used their bodies. They've abused them. All right. And look what's happening right now. When Hatshepsut, which was an actual woman who ruled over the land of Kemet, Egypt, when she ruled for her 20 years, she actually did a phenomenal job, better than most pharaohs that ever existed. She raised the company up, uh, the country up. She gave them the capability to develop and spread out into different industries. The country blossomed under her rule. And if there was a battle that needed to be fought, she took care of that swiftly as well. But you see, she had to pretend as if she was a man to rule. And as soon as her kingship was over, somebody came in and began to try to chisel away the history of her, the knowledge of her. Because another man came in and was totally disgusted and pissed off that a woman did such a phenomenal job, a better job than most men. So the balance is off. It's just facts. It's absolute facts. There's no way to get around it. Men and their egos and their clout chasing and their pocket watching and their lust have destroyed this planet, especially their lust for young women, women that are underage. Destroyed, has just destroyed this planet. Let's look at the meaning of the Shar. In Sumerian culture, the Sumerian term Shar holds multiple layers of meaning, encompassing concepts of rulership, divinity, and the measurement of time. In the context of the Sumerian king's list, a Shah referred to time. How much time did each king rule? Okay, and we're going to go into this a little bit. We're not going to go into the king's list, but we're going to go into deeper into the meaning of the Shah. Under rulership and authority, a Shah is often associated with kingship and sovereignty. It denotes the power of authority that a ruler held over a city state or territory. And there were many city states and many territories ruled over by these people in ancient times. Atlantis was not just the only amazing city on earth. That was one amazing capital that existed, but that was one of many capitals that existed on this planet that were operating at a very high level of sophistication. The ring city was just one. It wasn't the one all be all. It literally was just one of many. This aspect of Shah reflects the Sumerian belief in the divine appointment of kings who were seen as intermediaries between the gods and the people. Divinity and cosmic order also played a huge role. This term Shah also carries connotations of divinity and the sacred linking the ruler not only to terrestrial authority, but also to cosmic order and balance. Kings were often depicted and chosen by the gods, and these gods are not real gods that created anything in the universe. They are just advanced beings that look like us, that look like people, not green men with, whole, with, with antennas, okay? Not, green, not little green men with antennas, but people, men and women that put their pants on and dresses on just like we do. Women and men 
I'm talking about people, not the creator of the universe. We're talking about an advanced race that engaged us on this planet, that masqueraded as gods because of their advanced knowledge and their technology. When they ran into less advanced uh, indigenous cultures, we deified them and said, oh, they must be gods. Look, at the, look what they got. They have magic, just like we do today. Many people today would bow down in a heartbeat if they saw a man flying down from the sky. The Jesus has returned. It's the second coming. They bow down and start sobbing. Instantly. Today, in the 21st century, they'll do that today. It happened back then as well. Nothing's new. Nothing's new under the sun. Ecclesiastes. See, I can quote the Bible too. So we're talking about divinity and cosmic order, okay? Also, units of time. And I'm going to provide you the receipts for this. The Shah was used as a unit of time corresponding to a complete cycle or extensive period. Extensive period, which could be interpreted as 3,600 years based on later Babylonian astronomical texts, not based on Billy Carson, not based on Zachariah Sitchin, not based on Gerald Clark or anyone else who wrote books about the Anunnaki. And I'm going to give you the sources because I want you to look it up. Based on later Babylonian astronomical texts that inherited and adapted Sumerian terminology. This use of Shar illustrates a Sumerian sophisticated understanding of time encompassing both historical and chronological and cosmological time scales and cycles. The Shar also is a representative of legacy and interpretations. It's a multifaceted word. It has many, many meanings. In Sumerian text, it highlights the complexity of Sumerian thought regarding kingship, divinity, and the cosmos. The concept transcends simple categorization, intertwining mundane political authority with profound spiritual and cosmological dimensions. So we're talking about something that doesn't have just one simple meaning, but also has, it represents a complete ideology. Just like when you look at the Aum symbol, it looks like the three with the little dot. It's not a letter. It's a complete ideology. It's a complete understanding. The study of Shar and its use in Sumerian cuneiform tablets, especially within the context of the Sumerian kings list, offers invaluable insights into the worldview from one of the earliest civilizations. It reflects the Sumerian sophisticated understanding of authority of the divine cosmos and the nature of time themes that continue to resonate in the study of ancient cultures and their legacies. We're talking about a very sophisticated race of people. We're not talking about a bunch of dummies. We're not talking about a bunch of dummies that just hop on YouTube and start spewing stuff out of their mouth and attacking people. We're talking about intelligent people. We're talking about wise people. We're talking about sages, wisdom keepers. And we're talking about advanced beings. Many of us can learn from this level of knowledge that they've left behind from us, for us. But instead, a lot of people decide to utilize this information to twist it around so they can still put their boot on other people's necks and dominate them so they can be worshipped in the 21st century. They want to be worshipped today. The term Shar serves as a window into complex societies that existed in ancient Sumer. It reveals an intricate connection between rulership, divinity, cosmology, and is defined in this early civilization. The city between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Through the preservation, preservation of these cuneiform tablets, the ongoing efforts of scholars to decipher and interpret them and the legacy of the Sumerians and their profound contributions to human civilization continue to be appreciated and understood. See, I appreciate this knowledge. I appreciate what was left behind by our ancestors for us to figure out, for us to get a, to gleam an insight into their reality and their lifestyle and the way that they live. Some people, they don't appreciate it. 
They just want to abuse it. They want to abuse it so they can twist people to worship them. You see, that's what they want to do. But see, I appreciate the ancient knowledge because the ancient knowledge is giving us an insight into what's happening in the future and what's happening now. So when you look into these texts and you start to see the conflict and you start to see the hate and you start to see the love and you start to see the enlightenment and all these different aspects and natures of humanity within these ancient texts, you begin to realize they weren't too far off from who we are right now today. There's only one source that exists. And I mean the source of energy, the divine spark that empowers this entire universe. But don't let that word divine fool you. <laughs> Just because I use the word divine doesn't mean that someone else that can tap into that source or that knowledge doesn't twist it around and use it for darkness. The origins of the Egyptian mysteries come from the teachings of Thoth, the Atlantean priest king. And in the original Egyptian mystery schools, or the really the comedic mystery schools, people were only hand selected as adept initiates into the mysteries. Hand selected only. You couldn't walk up and say, hey, I'm coming in to get this knowledge. The teachings were to empower a person to learn how to go deep with inside themselves and tap into the cosmos from within, going to inner space, and then to expand that from within to the outer space, inner world, outer world, and then begin to affect change on the outer world through knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Over time, as these quote unquote gods with a lowercase g began to vanish and disappear due to war and everything else, people began to realize that we can continue these teachings. And over time, the Dark Brothers crept in. This knowledge can be used to not only uplift and enlighten, it can be used to destroy. It can be used to dominate and control. And so then all of a sudden, what started out as positivity and enlightenment turns into skull and crossbones, secret society, the Bilderberg Group Secret Society, the Trilateral Commission, all these other, the Illuminati and all these other, there's over two, 300 of them, secret societies. They all have one bottleneck back to the comedic mysteries. But they had learned there's power. Lagging should be fixed now. They had learned that there's power in domination. They had learned that there's power in understanding how to take truths and manipulate people with it by remixing it. And that's what happened to the human race. This is why we need to understand this stuff at the deepest of deepest levels. The reason why mainstream scholars argue over the length of time of the Shah, you have some universities and colleges that agree with it, and the biggest ones, um, mostly out of the out of the United States, because some uh, for some reason they're not falling falling for the agenda. They're beginning to realize the foreign archaeologists that saying this homo sapien mankind you know six seven thousand year age is completely false they're realizing now the further back we look the further back things go and they're beginning to realize and write papers peer-reviewed science papers on the fact that these tablets like the enumi elish are copies of copies of copies that have been handed down for hundreds of thousands of years that the Epic of Atrasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh and all these texts, they weren't things that happened a few thousand years ago, that they happened in deep, deep, deep antiquity. And then you have some of the other ones that, you know what, if we, if we tell this, this truth, we're going to lose our grant money. We're going to lose our research money and I've got a lot of bills to pay and I've got, I've got, I'm still paying off my student loans. 
I got 30 years to go to pay this student loan off. So if I jump outside of this evolutionary theory and start telling too many truths, the powers that be, and I do mean elite powers that be, are going to withdraw my grants and take away my tenure at this university. That's what's going on. <laughs> you see? Let's get into some sources and some information here because I want to give you guys my receipts because you know I like my receipts. You see, I got the forbidden receipts. <laughs> I got the forbidden receipts here. This is the Sumerian King's List. It's one tablet with four sides. So you're looking at four sides of one tablet. I've seen this and I've got personal photos of this that I've taken with this from the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. See, I, I, I actually have a real passport and I can really travel to these places. I'm not banned from traveling because I didn't, I didn't um, you know, have a record. Some people, their passport, they can't leave the country because they're being watched for what they've done in the past. But I can actually go. Let's take a look here. And now I'm going to read directly from some of these sources, mythological and epic texts. Let me spread this out so I can see it a little bit better. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Primarily Akkadian, this epic, which has Sumerian antecedents, often mentions kingship and divine authority, context where Shar might be used in its Sumerian form in earlier versions. See, in earlier versions or references are within the epic. <clears throat> Another example, prime example of a tablet that had been copied many times. There have been many versions of Babylonian, even an Akkadian version, and several other versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh, all very similar, almost identical. However, they keep going back and aging themselves further and further back. As people wanted to keep the story intact for the future generations, they realized I better make a copy of this. Remember, there weren't no printing presses back then. And they did it in stone so it can stand the test of time. <clears throat> so if you want to find out where you can find information on this, don't, don't look to me. Don't look to other YouTubers that are just trying to figure out how they can control your mind and turn you into a dark brother. And Makar and the Lord of Atra, a Sumerian poem that describes the conflict between the city-states of Uruk and Atra, and the term Shah could be used in reference to the rulership and divine mandates. Historical and royal inscriptions, the Sumerian kings list, which we just showed you. This is a compilation of kings, their cities, and their lengths of their reigns. You can look that up. You can find them online. If you can get your passport in order, hop on a plane and go to the Ashmolean Museum like I did. Talk to the director of the museum like I did and get the direct information like I did. Royal inscriptions of various Sumerian rulers. Tablets commemorating the achievements of Sumerian kings often include the term Shah to denote their authority and divine right to rule. Examples include inscriptions from the reigns of rulers like Gudea, Lagash, Urnama, and Urnama of Ur. Administrative and economic records also exist that you can look up. Administrative tablets. Although less glamorous than mythological texts and royal inscriptions, administrative tablets from various Sumerian city-states would use shar in context of land measurement or to denote authority over certain, over certain territories and administrative units. So some people have taken, some people on YouTube have taken this administrative measurement and twisted it on your mind to make you think something totally different. Astronomical and astrological text. Later Mesopotamian civilizations inherited Sumerian knowledge and used Shah as a unit of time in their astronomical and astrological calculations. While these are more typically Akkadian or Babylonian, they have their roots in Sumerian practices. Scholar, scholarly kavats. So if you look at these, it's important to note that due to the vast number of cuneiform tablets that remain untranslated, 
or fragmentary, identifying every instance of Shah would be an ongoing scholarly endeavor. There's references of it literally thousands and thousands of times. So I'm going to give you some sources where you could begin to do your own research. If you didn't get it, these were some sources. And you can go back and you can write down the names of these sources and you can actually begin to do some research like a real investigator instead of listening to other people. <clears throat> history begins at Sumer, 39 first recorded in history. This is one of the sources here where you can find out about Shars. History begins at Sumer, 39 first recorded history by Samuel Noah Kramer. This book is a classic introduction into Sumerian history and culture, offering translations and interpretations of key Sumerian texts, including discussions on kingship and the use of cuneiform. This is one of the sources I used in this talk, in this podcast and talk tonight. A second one, The Sumerians, Their History, Culture, and Character by Samuel Noah Kramer. Again, another great author. Kramer's comprehensive study provides an in-depth look at Sumerian civilizations, including their contributions to writing, law, governance, and his examination of Sumerian text sheds light on the concept of Shar and its significance. See, a real scholar, not fake scholars, real scholars that have real passports that can really travel and leave their city-state. Cuneiform by Irving Finkel and Jonathan Taylor. If you don't know who Irving Finkel is, just get off the video right now. This guy is, is, is the guy who runs the British Museum and teaches cuneiform. This guy is, is, is a linguist and translator. He runs the entire section at the British Museum, where I've been in person. This book is written by experts from the British Museum, offers insights into the development and use of cuneiform writing, including its application in recording the Sumerian Kings List and other historical documents. So make sure you get the book Cuneiform by Irving Finkel and John Taylor. I've used him in my lectures and presentations so many times. The guy's been on documentaries, TV shows, uh, docu-series, BBC News, you name it. He's world famous. Number four source, Sumerian mythology, a study of spiritual and literary, literary achievement in the third millennium BC by Samuel Noah Kramer. This work explores Sumerian religious beliefs and myths, providing context for understanding the divine aspects of the Shar and its relevance to kingship and cosmology. You have these sources here. I hope you guys are gonna use them. The Literature of Ancient Sumer, another one that I used, edited by Jeremy Black, Graham Cunningham, Eleanor Robson, and Gabor Zalomi. This compilation includes translations of Sumerian literary texts offering insights into the culture's views on authority, divinity, and time. And time. Then another one I used, Early Mesopotamia, Society and Economy at the Dawn of History by Nicholas Postgate. Postgate Books discusses the social and economic structures of early Mesopotamian societies, including the role of kings and the use of cuneiform and administrative purposes. Number seven I used, Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia, Early Periods, Sumerian Rulers of the Third Dynasty of Ur by Douglas Frayne. This volume includes translations of inscriptions from one of Sumer's most significant dynasties, providing direct sources for the use of Shar in context of the royal authority and divinity. Then I have some more sources that I went through. History begins at Sumer. 39 First in Recorded History by Samuel Noah Kramer. This book is a classic introduction to Sumerian history and culture, offering translations and interpretations of key Sumerian texts, including discussions on kingship and the use of cuneiform. So we're talking about all these sources here that exist. And guess what? I have all of these books. I have all of these texts. I've got my whole... Remember I did that book, um, that book workshop, uh, I don't know how many years ago that was, three years ago, when I showed you 400 books on my desk and I had another thousand books on the ground. We ended at 440 books or so. That's on Forbidden Knowledge TV. You go to Forbidden Knowledge TV, get the free Forbidden Knowledge TV app, download it, get the free trial, and look up the Billy Carson Forbidden Book List. And you'll see me go through every book. I got books stacked up higher than, higher than my head. 
and I'm going through every book, giving you the title and giving you uh, a brief description of what each book is about, because I know what each book is about because I've read them all. Early Mesopotamia Society and Economy at the Dawn of History by Nicholas Postgate. And another, number seven, Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia, Early Period, Sumerian Rulers of the Third Dynasty. And let's look at this here. I'm going to give you guys some source links. For researchers and enthusiasts, enthusiasts, I'm sorry, getting a little tired talking here, looking to find specific tablets mentioning the word Shah, resources such as Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature, the ETCSL, most people don't even know that exists, my, one of my biggest sources for information, the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, which I talk about all the time in my uh, lectures and, and interviews and podcasts, the CDLI, is actually originally hosted by um, UNLV, I believe it is. UC, I'm sorry, UCLA, UCLA originally hosted this, um, the CDLI, Online Digital Library Initiative, okay, UCLA. And then we have the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary, the PSD. Uh, these databases offer transliterations, translations, and discussions of thousands of Sumerian texts, providing a searchable resource for specific terms and their occurrences. So screenshot this and start we're going to work. Okay, start going to work. Anyway, guys, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. Thanks for hanging out tonight, and I'll see y'all soon. Peace.